I'm one of your hosts. I'm Haley Sater. I'm the ag agent in Wicomico County, um, but I focus on fruit and vegetable production here. So my name is Emily Zobel. I am the ag and home horn agent in Dorchester County, Maryland, and I mainly uh, my background is in vegetables and entomology. For this series, we usually invite a bunch of different speakers um, from within the university and ask them to talk about um, things they're either passionate about or their specialty. Today, we have Rachel Rhodes with us, um, who is a horticulture educator um, from Queen Anne's County, and she's going to be talking to us about starting seeds um, indoors specifically based out of Queen Anne's County. So I'm the horticulture educator and master gardener coordinator for Queen Anne's County. Um, and my programming focuses on a lot of vegetable gardening with a little sprinkle of entomology and native plants and baywise gardening. All right, I'll okay. go ahead. And like I mentioned in my little intro, I love vegetable gardening and seed starting is one of the best things that you can do when you are starting your vegetable garden. So growing plants from seed is a great way to get started. And because each plant has unique seed starting requirements, it helps to start by small with just growing a few varieties to get you started. Some seeds like tomatoes and marigolds are especially easy to start indoors. And other good choices for beginners are basil, zinnia, coleus, nasturgeon, and even cosmos. If you are a beginner, choose those first and then move on to more fussy seeds like petunias and peppers. I'd also like to bring your attention to this poster. It is a direct message from our federal, federal funder who wants to make sure that you have the right to access our program and any accommodations if necessary. If you have any questions or concerns, we hope you will let us know. And if you need any accommodations for any of our programs as well, you can always reach out to one of the educators that are providing the programming. So I have a bit of a problem collecting seeds. Um, and I feel that I'm probably not the only one who walks into a home and garden store and sees all the beautiful marketing tactics that most of these seed companies employ to get us to buy more seeds. I always buy way too much because that's my that's my vice. And then, you know, I have a crisper drawer full of seeds. Just, it's a problem and I know it's a problem. So the vital needs of a plant are much like our own. They need light and water and air and nutrients and the proper temperature to grow and thrive. Some of us can thrive in 85 degree weather and some of us like 60s. Seeds are the same way. With the right light and some simple equipment, it's gonna be easy for you to grow seeds indoors to go outside. Because each plant has unique seed starting requirements, start by looking at the seed packet. And it's gonna tell you almost everything that you need to know. It's going to give you the name of the plant. So you can see the laser pointer. All right, so we have the name. This is a melon. This is a mouse melon. It's also going to give you the date of maturity. So this is going to be ready. It's gonna be mature in 90 days. It will also give you planting instructions. And those are usually located on the back of the seed packet. It's going to tell you how many days after you start it in your soil before it will emerge. The seed depth, how deep that seed needs to be in your soil for it to actually grow. And then it will give you spacing information, the distance between each seed. They'll also have some great other little tidbits about that seed, plant, vegetable, flower. Um, and then when you can actually direct sow it in the ground or start it inside. In Maryland, we have this really great handout from our Home and Garden Information Center. It's Fact Sheet 16. It's planting dates for vegetable crops in Maryland. It's amazing. It gives you the different crops, our spring planting dates, fall, and then the planting depth, and then the distances, and then the rows. This is an awesome fact sheet if you, and you can find it right on Google or on our Home and Garden Information website. 
So what plants to start in the spring? For starting seeds inside, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, those are all ones that you absolutely have to start inside. Tomatoes, eggplants, and peppers, I usually start these by the first week of April. And especially because peppers can be a little bit temperamental on um, their heat requirements. Herbs are also fabulous to start inside. And then those flowers that you're going to use for cutting, such as zinnias and comma, excuse me. <laughs> so things that you want to do directly in the ground are any of your peas or beets, carrots, leafy greens, such as spinach or lettuce, kale, any Asian greens, radishes, turnips, and even Swiss chard. And we have another, um, great fact sheet. It's the planting calendar for Central Maryland. If you are not in on the Eastern Shore, it's fact sheet, fact sheet GE007. So there's a lot of different types of seed packets that you can get. You have some that are heirloom or hybrid. You have some seed packets that will say orga organic versus non-organic. And then we also have um, the genet genetically modified organism. So hybrid seeds are created by crossing two selected varieties, sometimes resulting in a better yield, greater human uniformity, or disease resistance. So it's just breeding two plants to get a selected variety. Heirloom is a term that is applied to flowers, to fruit, or other vegetables varieties that were being grown before World War II. But the heirloom definition is always open to dispute. Some people say 100 years, some, some people say World War II, and it can also go into um, the region in which they were grown. So, and then we also have organic seeds and non-organic seeds. Organic seeds, are seeds that are produced by organic gardening or farming methods. These are the same procedures used to produce organic food. In order to be certified or as organic, they must be produced by a certified organic operation. An organic seed is not free of chemical contaminants. Its chemical contaminants are organic chemical contaminants. Um, and then what about GMOs? Because we have a lot of um, consumer information about genetically modified organisms. Um, the FDA has a really great page on GMO crops and animal foods and beyond. And we also have a really great website called gmoanswers.com. So we have specific genetically modified organisms, corn, soybeans, cotton, potato, papaya, there is a summer squash available, um, but it is usually for large scale production ag. So that's usually a vegetable producer that's growing more than 2,500 acres annually of summer squash. Um, and these summer squash are resistant to zucchini mosaic virus um, that is very disastrous to our um, squash, pumpkin, and melons. We also have canola, alfalfa, some apples, sugar beets, and golden rice. All right, so on this page, you can see that um, this tomato, best boy, is a hybrid. And then the seeds of change for the shell pea, it's going to say organic. And it's only organic if it has that USDA organic symbol. Now, soil is just as important as the seed that you pick out. Um, and we're going to start our seeds with soilless mix. And these mixes don't actually contain soil, but they're blended to create the ideal environment for seed germination. And most importantly, they provide a good balance of drainage, water holding capacity, and they minimize problems with disease on vulnerable seedlings. Um, if at all possible, do not use garden soil when you're starting seeds. It generally doesn't drain well, and it may contain plant disease spores. 
And that's when we get um, dampening off. It's a soil borne fungus that affects seedlings and usually rots the stem and causes root tissue issues below the surface. <laughs> so you'll see the little seedling grow really well and then it will get this little darkening and then it will just fall over and die. Um, in most cases, infected plants will germinate, they'll come up and they'll look great. And then within a few days, they'll be just mushy and will fall over. So these are some really great examples of seed starting mixes. Um, and it will say on their seed starting mix, you have bags of seed starting mix. You also have these little pellets um, of peat pellet. And then you also have coconut coriander pellets, which are really great as well for starting seeds. I can't get anything to work. There we go. All right, so moving on to containers. Almost any clean container can be used for seeds um, as long as it provides good drainage and is at least two inches deep. You can save money by reusing cottage cheese containers or yogurt containers or milk cartons, aluminum pans, or even like clean clam shells from the produce department or deli. Peat pots are also a really great container. Um, and then the plastic cell packs like market packs, um, those are also awesome for starting seeds. And they range from a half an inch cell range to four inches in diameter. Um, and then the the caveat to this is making sure that these containers are clean. So you want to wash them with a 10 to one bleach solution. So nine parts water, one part bleach. So like I said, they need to fit the right root development. So you wanna make sure that you're choosing the right size container. Um, and some good media mixes for container vegetables are soilless mix with compost. Um, and then if you are starting like a native seed, you wanna make sure that you're using a little bit of sand um, and then a little bit of topsoil as well. To save money, you can empty the growing ma material, growing media from a container garden and remove all the plant residue and plant tissues and then store the media in a trash can or heavy duty trash bags. Um, but the caveat for this is, um, don't save media if there were any root diseases or problems and always place them in a sunny, sunny location. And container gardens are great for bush or dwarf varieties. This is just an example of using our milk cartons as a way to start our seeds. And milk cartons are great because they allow you to write the date and then the plant um, and then the variety. So the potting media depth for salad greens or radishes and herbs, we're gonna want a media depth for your container to be at about four to six inches. If you're thinking of something bigger like beans or beets and carrots and chard, um, or even squash, you need at least 12 inches if you're um, gonna do a container. So, and this is going right back to the seed packet. Make sure that you check the, the seed packet for the planting depth. You don't need to measure it precisely, but be careful not to plant any deeper than the directions suggest. The rule of thumb is that you should plant the seed two to three times as deep as the seed is wide. For example, a tiny sheet seed should barely cover or should barely be covered by soil mix, while large seeds like beans or squash should be sown about an inch deep-ish. If you sow seeds too deeply, they won't have enough stored energy to make it to the surface. You can always plant extra, se extra seeds because it's likely that not all of them will germinate and you'll thin out the extra ones later. So this is just another example where it's going to tell you on the packet if you should start it indoors how, how or when you need to plant it indoors. So this one is six to eight weeks before the last frost in the spring. And then you're gonna transplant it and when to harvest it. So we're gonna talk about frost-free dates in a little bit, 
The most important thing to remember is that you do not want your seedlings planted so early that they will have nowhere to go when it's cold outside. This is particularly true for our warm weather crops, which require a transition period to go from consistent indoor conditions to the outside. Um, and germination temperature is not always listed on the seed packet, but will play a important role in germinating warm season crops. This is helpful in case you decide to use a heat mat or warming source for the soil. So frost-free dates. The number of frost-free growing range ranges um, in Maryland from 150 in the far western Maryland to 225 growing days on the lower eastern shore. So we have a wide range of warm and cool season crops that can be grown in Maryland with planning and care. So a couple of things that I like to think about is when is my frost free date for our area? Extension has a really great um, page. It's called Spring Frost Free Dates in Maryland. Um, where you can go on and look at what you're planting and when we have a frost-free date, and then what am I planting? So I know if I'm planting cool season crops, they might le need a little bit of that frost to help with the sugars of the plant. Or if I'm planting warm season crops like tomatoes and peppers, I need to know when it's going to be safe to put those out. So the National Garden Gardening Association has a really great link or page um, where you can put in your zip code and it will tell you when you are going to be free of frost. So I'm going to look for that 10% range. So I know that my last 32 degree day on average is going to be April 16th. And then my last 36 degree day is going to be on May 4th. So I'm probably going to be safe if I plan it out and get my tomatoes ready to go in the ground by May 4th. Um, and then this is just for Easton. I pulled up Easton as well. Um, so as you can see, <clears throat> my zip code is Centerville and my frost free date is going to be May 4th. And then Easton is going to be April 27th. So even though they're really, really close to May in, in travel distance, Easton is going to have a week ahead of me in their growing season. It's also awesome if you just use a simple paper or digital cam or calendar to count back the number of weeks when you start your seeds indoors and then mark like, okay, I know my frost date is going to be on April 27th. So I'm going to count back this many weeks. So I know when I should be starting my seeds and when I'm going to start transitioning them outside so that they can acclimate to the weather. After you've sown your seeds and you've set them in a warm location, like on top of the refrigerator or near radiator for some heat, check your spots every day for signs of growth. Seedling heat mats are available to purchase and they're not very expensive and they can speed up germination and stimulate root growth by keeping the soil temperature at about 70 degrees, which most of our seeds need in order to germinate. You can use a fluorescent light if you have one set up like, um, like one of our master gardeners here, or you can use a window cell for direct sunlight, but always make sure that you cover your container to create an increase in humidity and temperature, and then remove that cover when the seed sprouts appear. So seedling roots need both air and water. Strive to keep that moist, that mix, that soilless mix moist, but not saturate it with water. You want to think of it like a damp sponge that contains both water and air. So moist to the touch, but isn't sopping. Um, and you want to apply water to the surface and let it wick up by the plants. So I usually have a plastic container underneath of my seedlings that I apply the water in and then the plants can soak it up that way. Um, thinning is my arch nemesis because I have such a hard time thinning my seedlings, but you absolutely do need to thin seedlings because you wanna choose the healthiest, strongest looking seedling to keep. 
If you have many different seeds in a container, they're competing for nutrients and sunlight, and then they're gonna get leggy or maybe they're not going to be as healthy. So seedling is an absolutely necessary part of gardening. <clears throat> so you wanna start thinning once it once the seedling has two sets of leaves. As you can see with this, these radishes that I sowed directly in the ground, they have their two sets of leaves. Yes, I sowed them very thick because I always sow more than I need. Um, and then I'm going to go in and I'm just going to selectively thin. Thinning means that you pull out plants that are impending the growth of your other plants. So sometimes we, like in this example, I planted my radishes really, really thickly. So I'm going to pull out other plants of those little seedlings of radishes so that I have a better crop of radishes and better root growth on those radishes. So when are your plants going to be ready to transplant? Because that's always, that's what we're plant, starting our seeds inside for, to get them ready to go outside and be a successful garden, right? So... You want to transplant when the true leaves appear. So here we have our first two leaves, our little cotyledons, and then we have our first true leaf right here. And you always want to handle the by handle them by the leaves, not the stems. So if you're taking these out of the container to transplant, if you handle it by the stem, you're going to crush that stem with your fingers. Um, if you're using peat pots, you can just take off the bottom and plant those directly in. Um, and then if you're using a growing, if you're making up another growing media to transplant, transplant them into a bigger pot before you put them outside, this is when you want to do like a 50-50 mix of compost and growing media. So after we've started our seeds and they're growing really well, it's time to think about when they need to go outside and how they can be hardened off. So hardening off is the process of exposing transplants by gradually taking them outside and getting them acclimated to outdoor conditions. You begin hardening off transplants one to two weeks prior to setting them outside to plant in your garden. So if I know my frost-free date is May 4th, I'm gonna count back two weeks and know that mid-April, I'm going to need to start bringing my plants outside to get them acclimated. So there is a little like caveat to this. You're not going to transplant when the temperatures are below 45 degrees. All right. So we're not putting plants outside when it's below that because they're, they're not going to go. Um, you want to place them outside in a warm, protected spot. Um, so it's not a good idea to move your seedlings directly outside to a bright sunny spot. You're gonna take them to an area that has some filtered sunlight and you're just gonna set them out for a few hours and then you're gonna bring them inside. And generally over the course of 10 days to two weeks, you're gonna expose them to more and more sunshine and wind so that they are ready to be outside full-fledged by your frost-free date. A cold frame, like the picture shown here, is a great place to harden off vegetables because it gives them a little bit of protection and you can close the lid if you need to, or you can vent the lid. These are a great source of um, area for hardening off. And you always wanna bring them back inside at night, especially if we're experiencing some dips in temperature at night just so that they're not, they don't go through shock. Oh, and that's all I have for today. And I guess we'll start with questions. I see a lot of them in there. If you have any um, questions about other gardening topics, we have a really great page called Ask Extension. Um, and then you can always go on all of our different Master Gardener pages about pollinators or um, Grow and Eat It or Baywise. We have a ton of stuff. Well, thank you, Rachel. Um, we do have quite a few questions in the chat. Uh, when should people in Delaware be planting? Um, and then we linked to, I think we linked to the the page from University. Yeah. They have their own. Um, sure, and rules and requirements for Delaware. Right. 
It's not going to be that different from no, it's not Maryland one. And I guess what we should say about the Maryland planting day calendar is I think it says on there it's for central Maryland, right? So if you're on the lower shore, we may be a week ahead. And... Yeah, and there's an eastern shore one as well on the oh, home garden information website. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have never seen that one. I'm familiar with the central Maryland one. Uh what determines the uh, the legislation to ensure that these labels are accurate. Um, and then um, Emily did link to a USDA um, yes. gov rules. Okay. Yep. Okay. That's going to be all USDA. Yeah. One of the other questions uh, we got was, what do you think about arrow gardens? And I believe that is a type of hydroponic system. Yeah. If you have the space for an arrow garden and you can do it, in your um, home, they are a great use um, for starting greens and microgreens. Go ahead, do it. There are lots of YouTube videos on how to do it. Um, I think we have a couple of pages on our Home and Garden Information website on starting up microgreens. They're very nutritious and very healthy and usually are minimal input system. So is there a preference for soil blocking is the next question. Yeah. Um, I For soil blocking, I really like to use coconut. I, I'm hoping that this person um, means in like the material, the soilless mix. I love to use coconut coir personally um, because I like the water holding capacity, capacity of so coconut coir. Um, and it's easily read, it's easily available and it's a renewable resource. And I don't feel as bad if I'm using peat moss. That makes, how do you know how many extra to plant? Hmm. Um, that, that's kind of a tricky question because everybody has their own kind of thing. If it's radishes, as you can see, I overplant radishes because I have to thin, a, I have to thin them. Um, but if it's tomato seeds, I usually do like three in a container or peppers, three in a container, and then I'll thin out two. Um, squash usually have a really good germination rate, so I'll do two. It's kind of like one of those guessing games where you kind of have to figure it out as you go and um, work with it. Do seeds expire? Yes, seeds expire. Um, but I am notorious, like this person, of buying too many seeds. So... What I do when I buy too many one year and I have them sitting around in my crisper, I do a germination test on them. So if I bought a copious amount of pea seeds, which I usually buy tons of peas because I like to have different varieties of pea seeds, um, <clears throat> I'll take a packet and I have like a blueberry, blueberry clamshell that's empty with a wet paper towel in it and I'll put 10 seeds in that packet. In, from that packet into my blueberry clamshell that's got the wet paper towel. And I'll let, and I'll close the lid. I'll let those blue, those pea seeds sit there for a few days and I'll see how many germinate. If I have a germination rate of seven seeds, that means I have a germination of 70%. I'm still going to plant those. Um, once I get down to like the 50% mark, uh, I'm, I might plant more of what I have, but I'm, but your germination rate is going to go down the longer you keep those seeds and in the condition those seeds are kept. So if you're keeping your seeds in an environment where the temperature fluctuates, like in your garage or somewhere in your house, the germination rate's going to decrease. If you're keeping them in your crisper, in your refrigerator, your germination rate is going to stay higher longer. Yes, I can I can send the presentation to Haley for her to send out to everyone. Yeah, so and like a, there's a question about germination rates again. So the longer you keep the seeds, the fewer are going to germinate, especially depending on the environment they're kept in. So not sure what thinning would mean. Thinning is selectively taking out extra plants so that the plants that you leave can grow bigger and stronger. And can they be replanted? Uh, usually not. Usually once you rip them out and crush that little stem with your fingers, they're not going to be able to be replanted. Um, how much space do you leave between plants when thinning? 
that's when you're going to go back to that planting guide and say, okay, I, I'm thinning squash plants. How much space between those plants is on the guide? Because every plant is different and requires a different space between them. So squash is going to need like two to three foot in between and maybe tomatoes, but radishes maybe only need a half an inch. When thinning, you can just cut the impending seeds. Yes, you can do that um, instead of pulling them. And if you're doing that, if you're cutting your um, like your radishes or your brassicas, those are great little microgreens. Okay, so what is the name of the box for hardening off? The box is called a cold frame. In a cold frame, I think we have directions on our home and garden information page on how to construct a cold frame. Um, but it's basically a box that you put in a somewhat sunny environment that has a lid and it's an angled box. So you're going to have one side that's taller and it scopes down to an awkward shaping triangle and you put a lid on it, either plexiglass, I'd recommend plexiglass versus glass, and you can vent it um, with different sticks um, and that, uh, that acts as a cooling off. And you can also use those to grow microgreens or lettuce or any of your greens during um, like the fall and winter and extend your season that way. Yes, we. Uh, so the question is, will you be sharing the presentation? I will send that to um, Haley for her to have to send out to everyone. Um, what do you look for in seedlings to thin out or ones to keep? Um, I make sure that the ones that I'm thinning out are not as healthy as the other ones. So maybe they're smaller or maybe they're a little bit more spindly. Um, and for the most part, that's what I look at, or if they have any disease. So maybe they're already starting to dampen off or um, they just are too leggy. So what is the best option for planting when you live on a second floor or you don't have a backyard? If you have a space like a windowsill or um, a balcony, container gardening is for you. Um, herbs are really great to grow, um, on a windowsill and so are microgreens. You can do that on a windowsill and be okay. And then containers, if you have access to a balcony or a space outside, tomatoes will grow great in a container. So will different herbs, so will peppers, so will cucumbers and bush beans. The world is your oyster when you're container gardening. So, um... Someone has a question, in Southern Maryland, Western Shore, should I use the Lower Eastern Shore as my planting guide? Um, I would use the Western Shore or you can move in between the Lower Eastern Shore and the, the Western Shore one because we're kind of on the same hardiness zone map, probably across on this, on the, from the Lower Shore to Southern Maryland. Is it possible to have multiple healthy seedlings in one cell without thinning? It depends. It depends on the space of the seedling. So if you're using one hole and planting three squash seeds, you're gonna have to thin those. If you have a half or four inch cell and you plant a seed in each corner, you might be able to divide that up and have four separate plants. It depends on the space. How do I figure out which cucumber seed type, for example, are not subject to disease? Um, so, it's usually gonna say it on the seed packet if they are resistant to certain things. And that's the same for tomatoes and peppers um, and squash. They're, they're gonna say it on there if they're resistant to certain diseases. What's the best way to prevent leggy plants? Um, I would say transplanting and moving them in the direction of the sunlight and then putting a fan on them, a low fan because they need that vertical air movement. Is there a better tomato for hot and humid weather in Maryland? Really depends on your preference. <laughs> Again, um, there are some really great different tomatoes in Maryland. Um, I love, 100% love Oxheart tomatoes. It's gonna be on our list for um, heirloom, what our heirloom tomatoes for this year. It's a great meaty, beefy, huge tomato. Um, and it's great for roasting or sandwiches. Um, Jet stars are also really good. People seem to love those. Um, I 
I love some good heirloom tomatoes. Um, anyway, you can, there's tons of different tomatoes and those are a few of my favorites. Um, oh, Rachel, yeah. I'm just going to mention that um, one of our next uh, series topics is just going to be on tomatoes. And oh, that'll be like see? Tune in. I think that's our last one because it'll be in May and that's about yeah. when you're planting tomatoes if you're not yeah. starting them from seed if yes. you're buying transplants. So Yeah, and our grow it so every year for our grow and eat it program we highlight a different vegetable and this year it's going to be heirloom tomatoes. So the Home and Garden Information Center is going to come out with a list of heirloom tomatoes that are really great for Maryland weather. So spacing refers to the plants, not the seeds. Um, so on the chart, it's going to tell you how far to plant the seeds from one another and then how far the plants should be from one another. Now, I will say this is if you buy a good packet of seeds. Sometimes That's true. seed packets are missing this. And then I, I think Google is your friend. Yes, that's very true. I like to have seed packets that have more information than seed packets that have a little bit of information because I'm still going to have to Google everything that I want to know about that seed. The more reputable companies of seed sellers like Johnny's or um, I, I think probably Burpees, you know, they'll put more information on there. It's like the discount seed stuff yes. you might find at Aldi. Might yes. Be this. Um, what is the best resource to follow? A step-by-step -step guide for Black Thumbs who desperately want a garden. I would 100% recommend that you go on YouTube and you Google on YouTube, just put it in the search bar, maryland home and garden information center because we have a huge queue of different vegetable gardening videos like how to thin how to set up your tomato cage how to string up tomatoes when to look for diseases that is it has a plethora of really really good information okay i have light i have a light filled sunroom but it faces the north so i'm not in direct sun Will that work for starting seeds? Um, usually north facing, a north facing window is not good for starting seeds. You really need a south to southeast or southwest facing window to get that six to eight hours of direct sunlight. So what I would suggest for this participant is to actually set up some grow lights um, and invest in some different grow light systems to be able to start seeds. <laughs> Oh, this this participant know, must know how much I hate squash bugs. Is there a variety or brand of cucumber and zucchini plants that are resistant to squash bugs? No, no, I'm so sorry. There's not. They are arch nemesis and they are horrible. I I have no suggestions for that. They're just, they're, ugh, ugh, I hate them. I ha there's another question. What brand do you suggest? I'm not sure I know what that is in reference to um yes yeah, so using lights with an so this question is i'm going to use lights from one of my hydroponic systems it's on a timer that's a great way of setting up your lighting system is having it on a timer so then you can make sure that your light your plants are getting the right amount of light for the right amount of time because everyone needs some rest even your seedlings need some rest from direct sunlight um, so making sure that you give them that time without direct sun is very important. How many hours of sunlight do most seedlings need to germinate? Six to eight. Six to eight. Six to eight. Should we use fertilizer or any any of the powders? Um, so you really don't need fertilizer until you're getting ready to transplant those seedlings into a bigger container. So once they have their true leaves, that's when you're gonna do either a slow release fertilizer or have a soil mix of 50% garden um, soil medium and then 50% compost. And that, when I say transplant, I mean taking it out of your little seedling tray into a little bit of a bigger container before it's moved outside. So it's like an intermediate. So um, what is the best way to determine if your location gets enough sun? So what you wanna look at in your home is you wanna find your south 
to southeast to southwest windows. Um, most of our phones now have a little um, compass so you can walk around your house and find that area that has the south to southeast to southwest light. If you're not finding it, then you need to set up a grow light system. Okay, so, um, or you can find light meters as well on, um, on different websites and you can use that as well. I grow tomatoes in a container on a deck in Baltimore City. What can I do to keep squirrels from eating and destroying my plants? I feel like even if you weren't in Baltimore City, you would have this question and problem because squirrels love our tomatoes. Um, so a couple of things. They really, really don't like Irish spring soap. So I kind of hang some Irish spring soap around my tomatoes. Um, I also they really don't like things that um, make a lot of noise either. So I've invested in um, some dollar store flower whirly gigs. I don't know if anybody's seen those before, but they're at the dollar store and they're just a really obnoxious flower that spins around. Um, some people use pie plates to kind of, you just kind of deterring them from the area. Um, or if you like hot peppers, plant a hot pepper around them because they just, they're not going to mess with it if it has that essential oil from a hot pepper. See, so don't like those either. The other thing you can do that I know we tell people of, that grow berries um, for birds is you can net your plant. Yes. It's like mesh. Um, and you would like net it at the bottom of the container. Yep. That's a really great um, way as well. And I'm sorry, there was a question about the Eastern Shore planting dates and that has been taken off the website. So um, that is not, that's no longer on there. So I just use a week before the central yeah. end because I'm in Salisbury, which is a little warmer than like mm -hmm. Anne Arundel County. Yeah. And I would also suggest checking your USDA hardiness zone map. Our our areas, our zones just changed. Um, so make sure that you're looking at that as well um, and checking the temperature on there. Okay. I'm oh, just are there herbs we can plant with certain produce to keep insects out once moved. This is my second time trying to start a gardening and they scared me away a few years ago. So not all insects are bad. So we do have a, a multitude of good insects that are great for your garden and we need those good insects to help with pollination and to get rid of all of our bad bugs. Um, but there are some things that you can, there are herbs that you can always interplant with your vegetable crops. I would recommend a reading a really great book on companion planting called Carrots Love to Is it Carrots Love Tomatoes? Oh, let me Google it and see. Carrots Love Tomatoes. Yes, it's called Carrots Love Tomatoes. It's an awesome book on companion planting, and it actually goes through what plants go well together when you're growing them, um, because some plants don't like each other. And they will absolutely deter the growth of other plants. So when you're planning out your garden, take a look at companion planting as well to make sure that you are planting things that like each other. Like basil does really good with tomatoes. And when you think about all the dishes that you have with tomatoes and basil and oregano together, if you're planting them together, they're gonna, if you're cooking with them together, they're more than likely going to grow really well together. Um, so, and they're also going to, basil's gonna bring in some really great little parasitic wasps because it has those little tiny flowers. Um, and then those parasitic wasps are gonna sting your tomato hornworms. And then that, that starts a whole nother cycle of more parasitic wasps that you're gonna love to have in your garden. Um, can you talk about stratification in reference to hyssop? Um, so how how do you do stratification? So um, it can vary in many ways. So you can either stratify a seed by putting a seed in some damp sand in a bag with damp sand and then putting it in your crisper for a little bit. 
Um, you can also just take your seed and scratch it with some sandpaper, or you can cut it with a rock, a razor blade. Those are all methods of stratification. Um, and some of our native seeds need cold stratification to actually germinate. But that's a whole separate um, topic and discussion, especially with native seeds. And dill does repel, repel squash bugs. Yes, they do. Dill is an awesome plant because it brings in so many different pollinators. Okay. Well, we're at um, almost exactly an hour. So that was perfect. Oh, wow. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you for coming on again. Of course. Well, of course. Of course. Anytime. And we hope to see all of you again um, in two weeks. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, cool season crops. So hopefully appropriate for, for right now when you're yes. yes. starting to use peas and lettuce and spinach and stuff. Oh, awesome. Love some good cold weather crops. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming. I hope you uh, have a great journey on seed starting. And if you have any questions, you can email me. I'm going to put my email in the chat box. Um, if you have any questions on seed starting, need pointers, just shoot me an email. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye.